Police converged on a shooting scene downtown and cameras followed. Then, just down the road, what was past became present. Another shooting on a busy downtown intersection, 3rd and Pine, at the height of rush hour. I was over there by Starbucks and I just heard like seven shots go off out of nowhere. It was really random. I, I, like, I didn't get to see who did it. I just see a bunch of people running that way down the street. There's a lot of people around here. It's crazy. A chaotic scene. Multiple people shot. Officers trying to sort commuters from victims. Let's move. Come on. Going. From possible suspects. Keep going. So all of a sudden, we just heard pop, 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 a bunch of gunshots, and everyone was just sort of stunned. Alex Bennett is a former nurse and ran to help. And he was crying because it hurt, and he was like, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, and I just told him, like, you're not going to die, you're going to be okay. I saw people running and ducking, and I looked at the body going down. Douglas Converse ran, too, to find police in the link station. I'm fine. Um, it, it, <laughs> it's upsetting, you know, I, that was really close, so... But I feel fine, you know. Glad to be one of the lucky ones tonight. I wish I could have been in more help. And now the investigation continues with not much to go on for a suspect description. I don't see any uh, future danger to the public. We've locked down the scene. Um, there's no active shooting going on at this point. But police are confident that though past became present, it will not be the future. This is crazy. <laughs> The protest against police brutality. A couple hundred strong <laughs> rolled through the streets of downtown Seattle. Yeah, we know all lives matter, but black lives matter too. And you're here to make a statement, and if Seattle doesn't shine as an example, then I fail. We all fail. When the group reached the business core on Fifth Avenue, lined with bank buildings and tall office towers, the destruction started. <laughs> The protest was organized by an anti-fascist group, and most of the damage was caused by young people clad in black. Keep moving up, keep moving up. Police officers formed a wall. Try to turn them down to four and turn the marchers around. It started with pepper spray. And then turned explosive. With the concussion grenades, police fired to back the crowd up. And you're not going to want to look at it, okay? Tore through this woman's leg. Do I need a medic here? A real one, a paramedic. Can you tell us what happened to her? Flashbang from the cops. So the group has been moving block by block. Police seem to be trying to keep them from getting to Interstate 5, which is only two blocks that way. Oh, Tension built as the night wore on. This protester tore through the police lines. An angry crowd gathered as officers struggled with him on the ground. I made the news twice in one week, Vanessa. <laughs> Remember Ryan Reed? You are the most popular guy in Snohomish County. <laughs> He's the manager at the Lake Rossiger store. The other week I told you how they're taking delivery food to their small Snohomish County community. So thanks for coming in. Uh... What I didn't tell you then was that Ryan is wearing yet another hat these days. I was not planning on being a garbage man by any means. <laughs> a few weeks ago, he noticed a lot of trash piling up on local streets, even at his own store. Well, turns out the two closest transfer stations are closed because of the coronavirus pandemic and concerns about social distancing. That's why he's renting this dumpster and keeping it at his store. For a small fee, neighbors can dump their trash here where they otherwise would have no convenient place to go. It's a huge relief. You don't have anything else to do. Otherwise, you're going to just go to Arlington, I think, or over in Everett. It's not just in Lake Rossiger. Earlier this week, Washtop put out a blog post saying that they have seen a big increase in illegal dumping along highways and rest stops statewide. Washtop didn't want to go on camera about this today, but when they did post the plea to stop illegal dumping on Facebook, it was met with some backlash. Folks responded with comments saying, what did the counties think was going to happen when they started closing the waste facilities? And, well, duh, close the dumping stations and this is what you'll see. Okay. What we're doing here is just providing the a place so we have a place to put this stuff. Lake Rossiger may be one of the luckier communities with its own vigilante waste collector. Ryan says he is willing to continue this role as long as his neighbors need the option. We love our community and 
we're going to keep this together. We are moving up this way because we can actually see a pretty good sized plume of black smoke coming up from the corner here. We're moving up on this just to see what it is, along with a good sized crowd as well. Oh, it is a big fire. You can see around to the right, it looks, is it a car? It is a significant fire. <laughs> Stick with us, we're gonna move up here. Excuse me. Watch these cars, this is an open road. Mike. Hold up, sorry, there's traffic here as a car is burning. I'm just trying to make sure our photographer can cross the street safely. Mike, come here. Come here, Mike. Cross the street now, please. Come on, come on. Husky, husky. So stick with us, guys. We have just discovered, I think that's a transit supervisor truck that I actually saw driving around earlier that has been set on fire, engulfed in flames here. Uh, we're in front of the AT&T, where are we right now? Fourth and Pike. But that, this has just happened. We saw the crowd kind of run this way. We don't, we haven't seen anybody set that off. But certainly it is a huge fire going on right now and we're hearing things explode inside the vehicle. And you can't really tell anymore, but I saw that car earlier. That's a Metro Transit Supervisor SUV. So it has the look of, of a law enforcement vehicle, but actually it's, it's for Metro, as far as I remember. You can see another car over there. What looks, it's the type of car that the police drive, but it doesn't look like it's marked that has been set on fire. It's certainly these, this is an escalation from the lull we saw earlier. We've got a large group of people, most of them taking pictures and videos. Holy hell. That was an explosion coming from that transit supervisor vehicle. I just saw the bumper fly off with that explosion. And I'm seeing somebody in the AT&T store stealing chairs right now. He's walking away with a stool. We're good. Yeah, I think we're at a good distance here. We're just making sure that we're not, excuse me, too close to anything that's really popping off. We've got an ambulance coming around the corner. And this is what happens I think to it's a mess. The scary thing here right now, though, is honestly, the traffic has not been diverted. We've been on closed streets most of the day, but if you look left here, Mike, we have traffic moving through this space. People are trying to navigate this street in between two blazing car fires, and protesters are interacting with these. I mean, that's a Lyft driver you can see right there. And that guy's taking a picture out his window. Yeah, there, I mean, there's no traffic control here. It's only a couple cars, but cars are freely coming down this road that people are milling about in and cheering and crossing the road and yelling. But we have two vehicles completely engulfed right now, uh, just here in the last couple of minutes. Again, the corner, Fourth Avenue and Pine, I think this is Pike, excuse me, we've been moving around so much. But the fires have returned. Certainly a lot of people here celebrating the destruction of these government-owned vehicles. And what we don't see here again is police. Police were really forming up a solid presence about a block back where we were, but we have not seen them here. We've got the fire department here without a law enforcement escort as they received in other places. But it looks like they're getting ready to move in. People are starting to run off. This is what happens. Certainly, happens. certainly the chaos is back. We had a lull there for a little bit. It was very calm for about an hour and a half. Uh, but now we're, we're back at it. As for how these cars were lit on fire, I could not speak to that because we just didn't see it. We were down the block. Oh, that was look left. It's the other cars just exploded. And then if you look further left, we've got uh, it's, that's a sheriff tactical vehicle that's right down there. You see it? You see that? So sheriff is trying to move a tactical vehicle in, and we've got teams of law enforcement on bikes that are pushing their way in. And then they're working to extinguish to the right here. They just got on top of this one. They're pulling a line while hosing it down. But we have not seen police make it to the scene here yet. Stick with me, we're gonna see how this develops. I am just struck too by the number of people that are here to to kind of take pictures and, and selfies and and smiling selfies with burning vehicles. It is it is surreal. People often come to observe crime scenes, but I've never seen anything like this. And this is going to be a big push, I would imagine, from police. That's an SPD bike squad 
two tactical vehicles behind them. I would expect them to, they're going to be forming a line to keep people back from the fire now. So the one car is out that the fire department has reached. Let's make sure we're not in kind of no man's land here. We don't want to be the first ones in line here when this goes down. So Michael, let me ask you, it's, it's hard to tell, Michael, where police are and where protesters are with, with the number of people simply ignoring the curfew at this point. Uh, how how big is the scope of this problem right now? Is it is it? Can you tell from where you are? Yeah, I mean it, it has certainly gotten more centralized than it was. Go 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 go! Excuse me. Hold on, hold on. Keep going. Move, move. We're getting thrown flashbangs right where we're standing there, so we're moving off. There is a no man's land right here. You can see police are pushing them back that way. I mean that's where the protesters are, and they're going to get pushed. You see this guy with the rifle moving in to fire more. Watch this guy. I think those are bullets. Oh, we're right in the gas here. We're moving, but I'll keep talking to you. So we saw that guy firing non-lethal rounds, kind of chasing folks off. This guy's pushing us back. There's a line of police herding us down. I'm with you. I'm watching your back. Just keep walking. Lots of tear gas. We got to go. Yes, sir. We're moving. So we have turned, because <coughs> we are fully, <coughs> oh, God, it's miserable. We're fully in the cloud of gas right now. Hits the back of your throat. Watch this pull parry. <laughs> that was a very strong push that we saw there, the more than we've seen most of today. People are throwing stuff back at the cops, but there's completely a cloud that we're in. Stick with us, just give me a second here. It's miserable. They pushed people entirely back from the intersection where those two cars were burning. A lot of gas. I saw non-lethal, what looked like it, kind of, a, what looks like a rifle, but you can tell he was firing to kind of hit them, chase them off. We're going to keep going. Our photographer is coughing, and I, my face is burning. More explosions from up there. I mean, look at that surreal image, though, the public market sign surrounded by smoke and gas and this tactical presence in downtown Seattle. It's, honestly, it's unreal. There's another firecracker. So to your original question, it appears to be, excuse me, hold on. We got to keep moving. This gas is drifting with us. All right, I'm going to jump in here. King Five's <clears throat> Michael Crow. All quiet overnight at the CHOP occupied zone in Seattle's Capitol Hill. You have five minutes to disperse. Until swarms of police arrived. Disperse southbound or you will be arrested. Returning to clear the area held by protesters for weeks now. Many left, but some did not, and pushed back. I was backing away recording, and they bear maced me is what happened. But for those that stayed, <laughs> Durkin's executive order gave police the authority to make arrests in the space. And they did. No, get over me! More than 30. I want you guys to picture your daughter's faces on mine right now. SPD showing force yet again. Acknowledging why we do need to abolish them. This was a day that some neighbors have been waiting for after several shootings and mounting concerns for safety in the area. It's too bad it had to happen like this. I can only really sit there and say that our message has been diluted through be because of the violence that has occurred and different insiders coming in trying to push their own message and our own agenda. But as I continue to say that, we must continue to stand on one accord with each other in love and unity. And when the sun rose, the protesters were gone from that core zone, but what remains, plenty of debris and crews working to clean up that area right in front of the East Precinct. You're inside this building. You need to come out with your hands up. You need to do it right now. Police eventually entered and cleared the East Precinct. We're home. Hey, we're home. Celebrating the return. We're back in our precinct, finally. Uh, there's a lot of work to do still, but um, thank you all for all the work. Um, the neighborhood, I walked the whole perimeter, and, and people are coming out. They are just grateful and thankful that we're here. While outside, the frustration remains, and the fight for black lives continues. This is not America. 
hell? This looks like Nazi Germany. In Seattle, Michael Crow, King 5 News. What's a grown man doing in a pink costume, inflatable flamingo costume on the side of the road? Main Street in Duval looks different. Just giving away free smiles. Turns out there was a shortage of them, and I had extra, so I figured I'd give them away. Greg Garat is one of the few people who've seen the impacts of the coronavirus firsthand. I actually work in the fire department. The virus, according to Greg, isn't only spreading germs, it's spreading fear. It's sad for us to get to see the people that we're caring for be, be nervous and, and anxious, and families are too. Hey, Marcus, welcome home. Awesome, getting the band back together again. Duval Flower and Gifts, this is Celeste. The pandemic is wreaking havoc on small businesses. We've got a good group of people that are always looking out for each other. Those people have names. Matt and Nate and Heidi, and I mean, they're, they're people that we know. Actually, all of the flowers that are going out today are get well flowers. Celeste is one of those names on Greg's list. These are going out today to someone coming back from the hospital. She works at Duval Flowers and Gifts, and it was business as usual until it wasn't. Just the today we decided let's just close the shop to the public. They're still doing deliveries, but customers can't come in. But on the street corner across from her shop, a glimmer of hope in downtown Duval, and it comes in the form of a giant pink flamingo. Just something to make you smile to um, just lighten the, the tension, I think is really, really good. I'm actually doing uh, community medicine. Turns out that smiles are more contagious than a virus. <laughs> Bye. I feel eager to, to start his piece, um, even though I know it won't be finished. Seeing that he was from Kent and was killed by Kent police officers definitely caught my eye. You know, the idea of time and, and how fragile it feels for some, but not all. I think this is a good way to bring that to paper. My name is Adrian Brandon. I've been working on a series called Stolen, which focuses on black lives lost by the hands of the police. Luckily, a lot of artists do create these beautiful portraits of these victims, and that is needed. I think it's great to celebrate the lives that they did have, but I really want to kind of show the lives that they didn't have. Tamir Rice was 12 years old. This is Chantel Davis. She was 23 years old. This is Miriam Carey. She was 34 years old. I will set a timer, so if they were 18 years old, I'll set a timer for 18 minutes. For every minute, or every year that they lived, I spend that long um, within minutes of painting that piece. So Giovanni was 20 years old when he was killed. I kind of push the timer to the side. I don't look at it. Um, and so that creates this sense of panic while I'm creating the piece, knowing that the time is going down and I'm not going to be able to finish the whole portrait. I'm feeling very anxious, kind of stressed out. And these feelings are supposed to mimic the feelings that black people feel living in America today. Um, we're not afforded the luxury to always be at ease when the cops pull us over. When the timer hits, it's a range of emotions. I feel sadness first and foremost, um, heartbreak that that was it. I'm trying to picture what the full piece would have looked like had there been no timer. It's frustrating as an artist just to not be able to finish a piece and then to realize that that represents something so much more intense and emotional and that it's a life that wasn't complete. You know, it's, it's a way for me to grieve. So I'm left with this unfinished piece and the viewer is left curious about what would more time have allowed. What would it look like if I did have 20, 30, 40 more minutes, two hours to complete the piece. And that's what families are left with. They're left with, okay, what was our son gonna be? He was 18 when he was killed. Was he gonna, you know, live out his dreams to be X, Y, and Z, or, you know, it just gets people thinking. That's the whole point of this, is for them to see these faces and say, oh, first of all, why isn't the face covered? Where were they from? What did they like to do? How did they get killed? So when you see the whole series with 50 names and stories out there, this isn't just Michael Brown, this isn't just Tamir Rice or Sandra Bland or George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. This is a whole list of names that we've been trying to grieve and 
and seek justice for and support one another with. It feels like a holiday pretty much every day. These are strange times in Seattle, a city like so many others on pause to stop the coronavirus. It's eerie. It, yeah. it feels kind of like a post-apocalyptic movie yeah. where like no one is out. <laughs> Usually bustling scenes across town now stand virtually empty as people stick closer to home, seeing new parts of their neighborhoods. I feel like, you know, I have a whole new appreciation for what we have right near us, even though we see it so often, but this is a completely different vibe. Our infamous traffic has been reduced to a trickle on First Avenue. Pike Place Market. I love coming to the market. I usually come here a lot. A relative ghost town without the crush of tourists and vendors on a spring day. When there's nobody out, it is a little eerie, but it also gives the city a new level of depth. And you can really see how beautiful it is and a lot of the history and the architecture too. But these unusual sights come with a cloud hanging overhead. But it's also sad too. Yeah, it is it's sad. sad. It's kind of, you have to wonder what, what you know, what's gonna happen. So what will we remember when this is all over? Places we know and love have been changed by this virus, in some ways temporary, like the quiet. No, it's not really good, but it's, uh, there's some positive parts. As for what is permanent from all this, Seattle will have to wait and see. More quality time, yeah, with yeah. just with your loved ones. That's the biggest take out of this whole thing, I guess. Michael Crow, King 5 News. This is a journey. For decades, Dr. Caprice Hollins has been teaching people how to talk about racism. But in the months since a police officer killed George Floyd, it's been harder than ever for her to keep up. Calling, emailing, we're all slammed. Dozens of different business and nonprofit leaders have requested racial awareness trainings. She even led a few for our staff at King 5. This is about what you do when people share with you how racism is impacting their lives. The people who attend come from all different backgrounds, but in each session, she asks everyone the same question. When did you first realize that your race mattered? When we sat down together this summer, Caprice even asked me. I remember yeah. when I realized my race mattered. I was very young, probably five or six, with my parents out camping, with my brothers and sisters, all five of us. And we all jumped into the swimming pool mm -hmm. and all of the white kids got out of the swimming pool. And it was so confusing because we came to play. Yeah. And my father was there with us. And I remember him bouncing me around in the water and asking him, Daddy, why don't the kids want to play with us? Why are the kids all getting out of the pool? And he had to explain it to me. Yeah. They're getting out of the pool because their parents don't want their white children in the pool with black kids. Yeah. It took her only seconds to recall her own story in Oregon. Now I'm in the fourth grade, my sister's in the second grade. Every day we walk onto that school ground. We are the only kids of color. These kids would surround us and spew the N word at us. And I never told anybody how being called the N word felt. I never talked with anybody about how I tried to be this good person that if maybe if I was nice, maybe if I made myself perfect, then maybe people would treat me, white people would give me a chance. Caprice says that is what it feels like for our nation's people of color. When I ask people of color this question, they'll say, I don't remember a time when my race didn't matter. And that's what we found when we sent a crew out to ask Caprice's favorite question. When did you realize your race mattered? 1975 kindergarten in Dallas, Texas. Early on, I'm an immigrant. What kind of Chinese are you? You know, where I'm actually not Chinese. But when we asked the same question of a number of white people. When did you realize your race mattered? My race what? When did you realize your race mattered? You know, I don't know if I can answer that question. I, I don't know if I still know my race matters. So was there any sort of particular a uh, thing that you can think of where you realize that your race mattered? Um, Is 
Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of that. Um, any particular incident or... Um, it's a tough one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That question creates confusion. How is it that in 2021, white people still struggle or are confused by that? Why are we not further along? I think that white people are confused by it because there's nothing in their experience that leads them to think that they should be thinking of race any other way than to not think about race. Don't notice it, don't talk about it, you're a good person. We're all the same. So our society feeds that message from an early, early age. It's a message that our differences don't matter. But Caprice's question leads many to realize as they answer. When did you realize your race mattered? Oh man, I guess like, I mean, being white, I think I had the privilege of not really having to realize that until like a little bit later in life. But uh, yeah, that's a tough question. And I guess I've had the privilege I haven't really had to think about that as much. I kind of look at myself and go like, how the hell did I not get this before? Why do I have to be 50 years old, live in Seattle in a blue bubble, and it still took me this long to figure out? with a lot of friends of color too. And like a fish doesn't know it's wet, the thing about privilege is it's set up so that you don't even know that you have it. That's why it's called privilege. There's gotta be a lot of other people like me who finally get it. And there are, Capri says, hundreds of people in her trainings questioning themselves in ways they never have before. <sighs> what the, oops, oops. 54 year old Joe Cheney of San Juan Island. <sighs> Ah, oops. Is struggling, and we mean painfully struggling, to wade through his daily typing and Microsoft Word assignments. Online classes taught by this private vocational school based in Renton. Office careers. After a career as a welder and mechanic, he's currently in a year long retraining program to become, of all things, a secretary. There's no way I can be a secretary. I, I have learning disabilities and I hate computers. Cheney's classes are part of Labor and Industries retraining program for injured workers. After an on-the-job car wreck in 2012, this once healthy Army veteran <sighs> isn't physically able to go back to his old job. All that's you know gone and been taken away from me. Cheney says his state-paid vocational counselor Thank insisted you. he attend the online school. L and I signed off on the plan and the. $13,800 tuition paid with public dollars. Are you telling me that you felt forced to oh, go to office Oh, I careers? was definitely forced. No. <sighs> she looks to be failing miserably. He can't complete assignments. But at office careers, they don't give any tests, just progress reports to the state. And Cheney's look promising that he's performing well and progressing as expected. It's a joke, you know, and it's the jokes on me though is the problem. The specific problem, if Office Careers keeps passing him along no matter what and gives him one of their certificates, the state can find he's fully prepared to score an office job and cut off all of his benefits. In my case, I would lose everything I own. I can't afford to not be able to get a job after this is done. Joe Cheney isn't alone. The King 5 investigators have looked into more than two dozen other office careers cases, including these disabled workers who say they were pushed through the program and left with nothing but a paper certificate, no skills, no job, and no more benefits from the state. They get the certificate whether they've learned anything or not. Catherine Mason is an attorney who's represented injured workers for years, and she says for at least 10 years, she and other advocates have complained over and over to the state about office careers. But nothing changes. Are those certificates worth the weight of the piece of paper they're on? No, absolutely not. In Washington, retraining injured workers is big business. In the last 10 years, LNI's paid out more than $70 million to schools for tuition and fees. And state financial records show no school's gotten more students or more money in this program than tiny office careers. 
Since 2010, they've raked in more than 7.3 million public dollars. That's more than double the amount paid to other accredited programs, such as Clover Park Technical College, Everett Community College, and Bates Technical in Tacoma. Unlike those other schools, Office Careers isn't accredited, and they don't have any documented track record of success. Hundreds of other programs used by the state show proof of performance, many with 80% of their students landing jobs in their field of study after graduation. Office Careers doesn't track those numbers. We feel that we're doing a good job, and I have no reason to believe that we're not. This is Office Careers. Uh, David Jordan founded Office Careers nearly three decades ago. He defends his program, saying most of his teachers have master's degrees who give students individual attention they wouldn't get at bigger schools. And the state doesn't require any proof that their students are landing jobs. We want them to get uh, a job. And that's the point of the training. Oops. The King 5 investigators went behind the scenes and observed Joe Cheney's classes in real time. We witnessed firsthand questionable teaching practices. After months of work, he's still typing just five words a minute. We watched him hunt and peck and make mistakes while, listen to this, the typing program continued to congratulate him. There were errors, and it said you had a perfect score. Right, right, yeah, it says, you, yeah, that, that's the way this whole thing's set up. We also looked on as Cheney brought up an assignment to finish that he says his teacher had already finished for him. Did you do that assignment? No, I did not. The project suddenly featured fancy fonts, bullet points, and perfectly lined up columns. Design techniques, he says he has no idea how to execute. Did the state get its money's worth today? Not at all. Cheney says it's a pattern. Assignments he didn't finish are fixed up and filed away as if he were able to do it. It's very falsified. It's not my work. It's somebody else's work on the other end. Does that happen at office careers? Uh, I, I would. The instructors are not doing the, the students' work. Jordan says some students may be misinterpreting the process and that his staff would never help cheat a student through the program. I have looked into that and it kind of created some laughing motions on our side that... Uh, some laughing? Yes, because the instructors do not do the students' works and, and, and say that this is theirs and, and um, uh, when it was the instructors. The Cheneys worry the state's retraining program will leave Joe in a hopeless uh. situation, disabled, unemployed, and cut off from the benefits he's entitled to under worker compensation laws. Joe's wife, Kat Cheney. It's unfair. This is not right for any person in this United States. Come on. They were going to be slaves anyway. Now they're free. So why are you guys out here testifying for the Asia Jones and her mom Daphne are rooting out racists with their Facebook group, exposing racism in the PNW. 4,217 pending, pending posts. posts about racist people. The common goal, finding racists and putting them on blast. For years I was like, man, I wish there was somewhere I could go where I could see like the racist company's business. I definitely did not see it reaching 12,000. That's a lot of people. The group's strategy is part of a growing online movement. So next this calling in over calling out. Dr. Relina Joseph recognizes it as cancel culture. Really, it's about calling out these moments of, of racism, of sexism, of homophobia. They are canceled, right? You're canceled from whatever platform you're on because we don't approve of what you've done. She's a professor at the University of Washington who explores the topic with various groups in racial awareness sessions. You've probably seen the trend on social media. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. This woman publicly shamed, then fired after racist posts and exchanges went viral. The first thing people revert to is, where do they work? You don't deserve to be working in public if you are a racist person. So far, members of Exposing Racism in the PNW have made sure dozens of people were fired from their jobs. I don't want it to just end at someone being fired. You know, we should be able to do something else and move forward. Her group doesn't usually follow up with the people they've exposed, including Jenny Cleland and Brandy Potter, who were fired from their jobs.
If I go out in public, I'm like, oh my gosh, did they see my post? Do they know my face? In June, Brandy posted an all live splatter meme on her Facebook page. My post was nothing racial. Hands up! Go shit! The meme became popular following Black Lives Matter protests in the streets. I don't believe that they need to be like on our main streets or on our highways. I definitely regret posting that. The meme was shared in exposing racism in the PNW. Having protests outside my work to get me fired, people spreading my face all over Facebook as being a racist person and slander. What do you want people to know about you? What do you have to say? I'm not a racist person. I'm Mexican American. I don't believe in racism. I believe that all lives matter. It, it, race to me is race. The more we talked, the more it became clear that being canceled on social media shut Brandy down. I don't like talking about racism. It's definitely easier just to back away from that stuff and just be like, you know what, I'm staying out of it. Being identified as a racist is like being identified as a, as a child molester or a murderer, right? There's, there's nothing worse in the world. Bringing that word of racist or racism in shuts people down from being able to actually talk about their actions. Okay. Oh, no, 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 you're fine. At first, Jenny Clellan doesn't want to share what she posted. I'd rather not say. After being canceled, she's anxious about being harassed. Listen to what she says mid-interview. Are they going to, like, shoot me or something? Like, the group? What do you mean? Like, see this and then try to kill me? What she posted got her fired from her job at a preschool in Lake Taps in June. People will call me racism. Total accident. It's not what I meant. And it hurts me because I'm the most caring person anybody can ever meet. Jenny eventually agrees to tell us about that Facebook post, which she wrote after passing a protester on the side of the highway. I'm tired driving home. And the, she was holding up a Black Lives Matter sign, which I totally agree. Black Lives Matter. All lives matter. I mean, I pat her back. Then I said, and I kind of wanted to run her over, which I didn't want to run her over. There's no way I'm going to run her over. I mean, <laughs> I have learned to be more careful with my words. Do you believe in our society that racism is a problem? Not for me, <laughs> but um, no. Because people are like picketing, you know, Black Lives Matter. Why do you think people are standing out there with those signs? I don't know. I know that the cop did kill that one guy, but I didn't even see that, what happened, because I don't watch TV. I just heard about it. <sighs> yeah, that girl, she definitely didn't educate herself. She didn't even know George Floyd's name. I know, you know, it's like simple things. She could have simply just looked up, why are there protests going on right now? Asia watches Jenny's interview. Are they gonna, like, shoot me or something? Like, the group? Did she just say what I think she just said? Try to kill me, or? Why would she think that? No, I've, no, 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 no. There's people trying to shoot us. You know, I feel like this is just something that tells us, oh, maybe we shouldn't be more vocal. Maybe we should be less vocal on Facebook or watch the words we say, but I don't think it's gonna change their ways. No, I don't think that's gonna happen. So does cancel culture work? When people have asked me that question, they're expecting me to say, no. And the saying of no to me means telling, telling a certain group of people to be silent. And I'm not willing to tell anyone to be silent around questions of race um, ever. What we need are these larger ways of creating education and structural change. I can't say even do anything to the individual solves much besides, you know, getting that individual out that establishment. Beyond that, I can't really, I genuinely can't say that it solves racism. It doesn't encourage people like Brandy to want to talk about race or people like Jenny to want to learn about it. I guess that's a good thing to think about. And I could think about how we can go about educating them. Like, like I said, I don't think it's really an interest of theirs, you know, from what I've seen, you know, but it's something I could always look into. F George Floyd, F Black Lives Matter. Asia and her mom don't plan on stopping. I just think it solves the problem for the minorities and the people who don't like racism. It brings us a sense of peace because we can do a little bit of something. There's not much we can really do, but with this, we have a little peace of mind.